Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. My name's Ian Shapiro and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to uh, kick off this event and welcome His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations to Yale to give the, um, the, the Walker Lecture on in, in International Affairs. Um, we're delighted absolutely delighted to be able to do this. This lecture was uh, endowed by the Honorable George Herbert Walker III from the Yale class of 1953 and a former U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Hungary. Um, he established this lecture series in 1986 in memory of his father, a distinguished graduate of the Yale co uh, College class of 1927. I'm, I'm pleased to note that uh, Ambassador Walker is here with us today, so let's give him a hand and thank him for <laughs> making this occasion possible. <laughs> uh, the Walker Lecture is given here at the Macmillan Center uh, every year and has uh, been the, a, a very in august uh, list of figures has given it in the past, such people as Madeleine Albright, Strobe Talbot, Richard Holbrook, <coughs> Mamfele <coughs> Ramfele, uh, Sir John Major, Brent Scowcroft, and many others. Um, and I also, it's a particular pleasure for me today that, uh, that our president-elect, the, the provost of the university, Peter Salovey, has agreed to be here as the Master of Ceremonies and introduce the Secretary General. So, Peter, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all very much. Appreciate that. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon uh, as part of the Walker Lecture to introduce Secretary General Ban Ki moon. As you know, he is the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations. His priorities have been to mobilize world leaders around a set of new global challenges, from climate change and economic upheaval to pandemics and shortages of food, energy, and water. He has sought to be a bridge builder, to give voice to the world's poorest and most vulnerable people, and to strengthen the organization itself. Ban Ki-moon grew up in war and saw the United Nations help his country to recover and rebuild. <clears throat> that experience was a big part of what led him to pursue a career in public service. As Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon is determined to see the United Nations deliver tangible, meaningful results that advance peace, development, and human rights. Ban Ki-moon took office on January 1, 2007, was unanimously re-elected by the General Assembly in June 2011, and will continue to serve as Secretary General until the end of 2016. Commitments that have defined his tenure include promoting sustainable development, empowering women, supporting countries facing crises of instability, and generating new momentum on disarmament, arms control, and nonproliferation. The title he has chosen for his lecture is Shaping Solutions for a World in Transition. Please join me in welcoming Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Provost Salovey. Let me offer my, first of all, sincere congratulations you. on your appointment as the next president of this esteemed university, Yale. And I thank uh, Professor Ian uh, Shapiro, uh, director of the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. And of course, my deepest appreciation to Ambassador Walker, who has established uh, this lecture uh, series. It's a great honor for me uh, to be one of the many distinguished speakers to this uh, lecture series. Uh, dear Students and distinguished faculty members, friends of uh, Yale community, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I guess that you came to hear a Korean on the international scene. 
But I hope you don't mind. Uh, I'm not going to dance uh, Gangnam style today. <laughs> 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 When uh, Sai Gangnam Style came to my office uh, a few weeks ago, <laughs> the reporters just uh, relinquished my title as having been number one known South Korean in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any regret. You know, yeah. <laughs> I hope that uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of Korean young men or girl, women would become as popular as uh, Sai, Gangnam Style. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored to deliver the George Herbert Walker Lecture. I have been privileged to work with the members of his family through uh, many years uh, through my public service, including both uh, President uh, Bush, 41st and 43rd uh, President, both. It is also good to be here on campus again. I was here January 2010, immediately after, I think the first day after Haitian earthquake uh, happened. Uh, I was attending this uh, global colloquium of university presidents uh, hosted by uh, President Levin at that time. Uh, President Levin and Yale community were very generous enough to provide, uh, to, to give, uh, very generous uh, support for Haitian uh, victims at that time. And I'm very happy to be back uh, to this. And one of my greatest pleasures is always to meet the young students uh, from whom I really get inspiration and energy uh, to really motivate me to work harder and harder as a Secretary General of the United Nations. Yale is an extraordinary university that has made its mark in the United States and around the world. And in fact, Yale has put its stamp on the United Nations, literally. The United Nations logo, which I'm wearing now, a symbol of hope for people around the world, was designed by a very distinguished Yale graduate named Donald McLaurin. I do not know how many people you know, among you know uh, this fact. I am really proudly wearing this logo designed by one of uh, Yale graduates uh, uh, every day. It sends that message in many ways. Our blue helmet of peacekeepers and uh, many uh, voluntary workers around the world helping many poor and uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable group of people. I saw that symbol of the United Nations myself when I was growing up uh, in South Korea. I was born uh, before the end of Second World War. Then immediately after <coughs> Korea was uh, liberated, uh, Korea was attacked by North Korean uh, aggression. Then during that time, we saw the hope and sent this hope from the United Nations. People believed that there would come our friends, the United Nations, led by the United States <coughs> and the 20 other uh, United Nations uh, member states who came to uh, support us and rescue us uh, from almost being you know, collapsed, invaded by the North Koreans at that time. Uh, since then, <coughs> to the Koreans, particularly myself, the United Nations has been beacon of hope. Even these days, to billions of young people, even billions of many people, the United Nations is a symbol of hope, as a beacon of hope. And I'm humbled to carry that uh, beacon and torch of hope to many people, uh, even these days. Now, let me talk about this uh, logo. <clears throat> the many member states wanted to have a United Nations logo to feature the Earth. But they had uh, different ideas on which side of the planet to show. Then Mr. McLaurin's uh, design depicted all continents of the world <clears throat> equally. 
Then some people suggested that uh, there should be links binding countries together. Then some people feared that in such a case, the world looked like you know, bound by some chains. Then Mr. McLaurin used his uh, diplomatic <coughs> and wisdom by <coughs> framing the globe with olive branches, the timeless symbol of peace. This is what I'm carrying, and everybody is carrying this way. And so the seal was born, the Yale's lasting legacy uh, to the United Nations. <coughs> The world has changed dramatically since then, since 1945. There has been dramatic changes in international, <coughs> political, economic, and social uh, situations. We are now living in a time of dramatic transformation. The political landscape is shifting as people across the world rightly demand freedom, accountability, and equal opportunity. The economic landscape is also evolving. But new powers emerge, and global interdependence deepens. The changes are environmental to, as we strive to pull back from overstepping the planet's natural limits. This is a time of turmoil, vulnerability, and change. I'm saying that uh, we are living in an era of uh, inequality, injustice, instability, and intolerance. We face a burning question. How do we shape solutions for a more secure and prosperous world? In my conversations with the world leaders and encounters with people around the world, I return again and again to three common themes. First, the leaders need to listen to their people very attentively and very seriously what their aspirations are. The second, all of us need to connect the dots among the challenges we face. There are many global challenges, starting from climate change, energy, food, water, and gender empowerment, education, urbanizations. You name it, there are so many, so many problems. Uh, recently, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, during the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, member states have identified the 26 major uh, challenges which we have to address. If you look at these issues, they are all connected. So we need to link these through, uh, all these links should be, uh, all these doctors should be linked. Then third, we need to find the linkages, not just among the challenges, but link the people, between the peoples, and create new, new partnerships and alliances to get things done. That is the most effective way to solve problems in our networked world. Let me now focus first on the upheavals across the Arab world. For too long, People were denied opportunities, their dignity, freedoms, their real very voice. They have been neglected and denied. And for too long, too many trading and security partners of deeply flawed regimes were content with the repressive status quo. Many leaders who failed to move with the democratic tenor of themes, times, Indeed, who actively and violently suppressed their people's aspirations are now gone from the scene. May not be at the helms of their countries for much longer. Some, most of them have already gone, but still there are some leaders who must go. But people are fighting for their rightful choice and opportunities. But democracy is not assured. Democracy, it takes sometimes long, longer time than expected. It cannot be established firmly through just one or two uh, elections. 
as several countries pursue transitions, uncertainty shadows hope. In others, leaders seem to think winds of change will not blow their way at all. I've been saying to the world, this wind will continue to blow. Nobody knows where this wind will blow. There is no sanctuary. No leaders will be immune if they are not listening to their people. That has been my continuing message. Let me talk about the situation in Syria. I'm gravely concerned about this, the situation in Syria. This is the top most serious situation where this international community must address. I have been telling President Assad of Syria that listen to your people. Listen what they are asking for you to do. But in the face of peaceful demonstrations, he responded. He resorted brutal, brutal force. Each day in Syria brings new reports of appalling violations of human rights and tragic suffering. We even tried to have a very brief pause during this most, most important holidays of Muslims, holidays called Eid al Adha. Just the four hours of a pause. It was just a totally ignored and abused. I was uh, deeply disappointed that both sides ignored and violated the ceasefire. The United Nations is rushing medicines and food to Syrians inside and outside the country. There are at least 2.5 million people who have been displaced internally, and there are more than half a million people who took refuge, who are now being accommodated by the neighboring countries, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. As winter is approaching, I know that the winter in Syria, in their region, is very severe. There will be a huge, huge humanitarian situations and crisis. Even as we staunch the wounds, we have to try to stop the blood my message has been that at any cost, we must stop this violence. We have uh, four priorities in addressing a Syrian situation. First, let this violence stop. Whatever the differences and grievances there may be. And then immediately start a political dialogue for political resolution of this issue. Military is not, unsol not an option. Military solution is not an option. Then secondly, we have to protect the human rights and dignity in accordance with international human rights and international humanitarian laws. So many people's human rights have been abused. And thirdly, we have to <coughs> provide all this, not only provide assistance, we have to make sure that nobody will be <coughs> immune from this uh, situation. And we have to also have uh, <clears throat> united forces, united voices of the people in the region. The Arab countries are divided. The Security Council is uh, divided. And Syrians are divided. We are deadlocked at three situations. Their own people, Security Council, and Arab people. I repeatedly warned the government and opposition that they cannot solve this problem by military solution. Syria needs a clean break from the past. But the transition they need can be achieved through negotiations and dialogue. The risks to the wider region are clear. Already we are seeing spillover effects. The relationship, the very tense situation between Syria and Turkey, between Syria and Israel, and also Lebanon. We have seen all spilling over effects. We have to prevent this situation from further spiraling out of this uh, control. 
Syria is a stark reminder of how much is at stake and how much can be lost if the international community does not unite for peace and if leaders do not heed the demands of their people for empowerment, openness, and dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to a second theme, second phenomenon in this 21st century, the complex links among the challenges we face. Trade, travel, technology, and Twitter continue to knit the world closer together. But today, it is not just the people who are more in the interdependent. So are the issues. All the issues, as I have said, are very closely interconnected. We will not address <coughs> climate change without sustainable energy. We will not promote decent work without quality education. We will not defeat hunger and disease without empowering women. Sustainable development requires us to make these associations. We can see this clearly in Africa's Sahel region. There are nine countries in Sahel <coughs> comprising 16 million people. Among 16 million people, more than 4.5 million people are suffering from long drought of long spell of drought, flooding, and climate change impact. We are seeing Again, another serious humanitarian crisis in, in the Sahel. <coughs> it again creates a very serious political stability, instability. The people of the Sahel are being buffeted by repeated shocks caused by uh, human beings and natural disasters. Lawlessness is allowing extremism and international crime to take hold. We must deal with these issues in a comprehensive way, not as isolated, unrelated problems. We must identify the crucial connections and then drive hard them with integrated and well-planned solutions. And this is what I'm doing. Now, I'm going to soon report to the Security Council a concrete and packaged plan to address the situation in Mali. As you might have been following in the international media, the situation in Mali, particularly in the northern side, are just terrible. The human beings are just slaughtered through this uh, application of a Sharia law. The women are just uh, ignored, neglected, and abused. We cannot uh, just keep this situation continue like this way. We know that we can never do this on our own. We need a partnership. This leads to my third items, the building partnership among countries. The government may be central actors, but even they recognize the need to mobilize others, celebrities and doctors, CEOs and NGOs, imams and rabbis and priests, and professors and academics <coughs> and students, and everybody can play a role. Nobody can address all the issues, but anybody, any of you, can play some role. That if we combine this uh, some roles, I think that this is what I'm saying, the partnership. The United Nations is trying to um, forge stronger and greater and bigger partnership to address all global challenges. Let me say a few examples. Our every woman, every child, effort aims to save 16 million lives by 2015. I believe that this is one of the most successful partnership campaign which United Nations has raised. To save 16 million human lives, particularly women and children. When women are giving their lives while giving new, birth, new, new lives, this we have to prevent. We have to stop. This is intolerable, again, a situation. Then scaling of nutrition. There are many young children who cannot live longer than five years before they celebrate their fifth birthday. Millions of children are dying. 
I have launched last June Zero Hunger Challenge. There are one billion people even today who will go to bed hungry. In this world of plenty, it is morally wrong that people are starving from lack of food. We have, I'm told by experts, that we have enough food in this world. But why there is a food crisis as such? Because of the unreasonable price hike of food, unreasonable way of distributions, and all this has caused the serious uh, food problem, food security issues. I don't call it at this time food crisis as such, but still, if we don't manage well, we will again meet this uh, food crisis. Our global effort is focused on sustainable energy. Without energy in this world, as you have seen uh, just even now, it is continuing in New York and uh, New Jersey, affected by a sandy a storm. That without energy, this modern society cannot function at all. No transit, transportation, no electricity, and no telephones, no communications, no schools. So we have to provide energy to all the people around the world. United Nations has a very ambitious target. By 2030, we will provide every single citizen around the world electricity, energy. That's one of our top priorities. And I think we can uh, do it. We are also focusing on education through a new initiative called Education First. Last September, uh, together with uh, Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the Director General of UNESCO, I have launched a global education for the campaign. There are 61 million people, young people in the world, who are not able to go to school, to, uh, who are just uh, not able to go to school. They are just illiterate. The illiteracy rate is uh, so high, depending upon which country you go. And we have to make all these people literate. As you may have been following up this, there was, again, very tragic <coughs> things which happened to a young girl, Malala Yusufzai, Yusufzai in Pakistan. <coughs> the terrorists who attacked her showed what they fear the most. I don't think these are terrorists, they fear the guns or weapons by the government. I believe that they, what they fear most are education. Maybe girls with a textbook. And that came to my mind, and I tweeted, and we, I used the social media and tweeters, and sent the, this message. Then there was uh, outpouring responses from international community. The tweeter called the girl with a book. It's just a simple and extremely powerful concept. People all over the world sharing an image of a girl reading a book as a message of solidarity and support for girls' education. When people are educated, then the terrorist or extremist, there's no place for them to stand. They are all educated. They are armed with their intelligence. That is what the United Nations is trying to educate all the young girls and boys around the world. F photos, this very small photo, a girl with a book, reading a book. This has been pouring in from Pakistan, Egypt, Cameroon, Brazil, Japan, and all the world beyond. Among so many, so many billions of photos, you will find one of mine, you know, reading with my granddaughter a book. This has gotten more than, I was told, three million followers uh, in the Twitters. So this is what the United Nations is doing. This may be very small, 
But even a small concept, trying to educate the young girls, I think it can make a huge difference. The student studying in this very esteemed distinguished Yale University will never understand this kind of situation. When you go to Africa and other developing world, I was wondering why there are so many young people just wandering around on the street. At this time of school, they should be all studying in, in the schools, but they are just um, wandering around. So we have to make a change on this matter. Ladies and gentlemen, when I think of partnership, I come naturally to the United States. That is because the United Nations and United States are natural partners. The reason I'm <coughs> coming to Yale University is one of the uh, continuing efforts on the part of me and on the part of the United Nations to reach out to American people so that American people and United Nations can forge a stronger partnership. Because we believe that United Nations and United States share same ideals and goals of the United Nations Charter. It was the United States who conceived the idea of the United Nations right after World War II. President Franklin Roosevelt had conceived that idea, and he even made all this a charter. And Eleanor Roosevelt drafted this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Therefore, we need the stronger support and more active contribution by the United States. And that is why you know, I'm sending uh, this message through you to many uh, young students. We share an impulse, a calling to serve, to feed the hungry, to support the democracy, to be generous, and first on the scenes in times of disaster. And the United Nations is indebted <coughs> to the United States for hosting our headquarters in New York City. When Sandy Storm affected all these many hundreds of thousand people <coughs> in, uh, you know, during last week, I telephoned to uh, governors of uh, New York and New Jersey and mayor of New York, and I sent a letter of sympathy to uh, President <coughs> Obama. Now, talking about uh, President Obama, this is my first public opportunity or public speech to warmly congratulate President Obama on his re-election. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have both. <laughs> I know that uh, <clears throat> some of you must have voted for him, but some of may not have voted him. But uh, <clears throat> This is democracy. And when you elect a leader as a president, I think everybody should be united and rally behind this leadership. <clears throat> US-UN partnership, I expect and I hope, will be even more strengthened and stronger and more effective. That's why, that's because we share many goals, as I said, including ending the violence in uh, Syria, and getting the Middle East peace process back on track. Let me say just a few words about the Middle East. As you might have already read in the newspapers that the Palestinians are trying to exercise their legitimate right for um, a statehood. As the Middle East region undergoes fundamental changes, much is also at stake for Israel and Palestinians. <clears throat> the cost of the continuous stalemate and ongoing illegal settlement continues to rise with each passing day and each missed opportunity. The parties themselves and the world at large have a profound interest in a just and lasting peace. <clears throat> a two-state solution remains the only viable option to end this conflict and the occupation that has endured for almost a half a century. Realizing this vision requires more determination. 
not more delay. The foundations for peace remain. The UN Security Council resolutions, a roadmap, Arab Peace Initiative, and Madrid principles. There are many principles and guidelines which really help both parties, Israelis and Palestinians, so that they can live in peace and security and side by side as a neighbors. As you know, the issue of Palestinian status <coughs> at the United Nations is once again in the news. The Charter of the United Nations makes it clear. Such matters are solely in the hands of member states. I share the frustrations that the two-state solution may seem <coughs> ever more distant. As all involved now consider the options, we now we know that actions have consequences. None of us would want to see harm to the prospects of peace in the Middle East. None of us should act in any way that would place a return to talk at risk. There can be no substitute for meaningful negotiations. As we have warned repeatedly, without strong leadership by the parties and international community, the two-state solutions and the commendable institution building achievements of the Palestinian authorities are in jeopardy. <clears throat> I once again appeal to all those with influence, the Middle East peace process is on life support. Do not pull the plug. Breathe new life and hope for those people. The region and the world cannot wait. I believe that that their aspiration for Palestinians, for their statehood, has long overdue. There must be a solution to this. But this solution should come from a negotiated settlement. This is what I have been saying to President Abbas and also Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel uh, to engage in dialogue. I was in the region early this year, meeting with the leadership in the region. I may go back to the region uh, soon to help facilitate uh, their negotiated settlement on this. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear, <coughs> dear students, we also need a strong multilateral engagement to ensure the success of the democratic transitions that are on the way across the world. We are pressing to achieve the Millennium Development Goals before the end of 2015. We are now uh, discussing very seriously what the development agenda should be after 2015 when <coughs> we meet the deadline of the Millennium Development Goals. Combating climate change is a paramount challenge. I was very encouraged to hear President Obama on his election night on the victorious, victorious statement that he mentioned warming planet. This just one just one word gave a lot of hope to uh, many people. When I issued my statement congratulating President Obama, I mentioned that he should do more on climate change. And I'm glad that the, this climate change will be one of the top priorities of the uh, second term of President Obama's administration. World leaders have agreed to forge a legally binding treaty by 2015, last year in Durban. And I'm going to attend this UN Climate Change Conference next month in December in Doha. The silence, science has made it plainly clear that climate change is happening much faster than one would expect. It's a human being which caused this climate change phenomenon. So it must be human being, it must be we, human being, who must prevent this climate change phenomenon from further progressing before it is too late. Climate change does not respect the borders. Whether you are coming from United States or Korea, Japan or Africa, there is no border for nature. We cannot negotiate with the nature. We have to reconcile and fully cooperate with the nature. 
so that we can hand over this planet Earth to our succeeding generations in a most environmentally hospitable and sustainable way. That is our moral and political responsibility. I think, professors, I think you have a um, very important responsibility to teach the visions to young students. This was one of the messages which I conveyed to President Levin, that academic community, the educational institutions, they have a very important responsibility to play in addressing the global challenges together with the United Nations. And one responsibility for you is to, to teach young people, young generation, who will be leaders tomorrow, to have a bigger vision, bigger vision, to have a, a vision of a global citizen. The people living in the United States, studying in these uh, very good ed educational facilities with good conditions, may not appreciate what you are enjoying. But what you enjoy now should never be taken for granted. This should be shared with uh, so many people around the world. That's what I'm saying. Think big and think uh, globally. Even though you may act uh, locally, then there is no difference between local and global. When you act locally with a global vision, yeah, you are contributing uh, to uh, globalization. There are so many challenges we have to address. Everything I have seen as Sec Secretary General convinces me that no country in the world can do it alone. We need to have a collective responsibility. We have to address all these issues collectively. Maybe the United States can lead this campaign as the most powerful, most resourceful country. But any most resourceful countries cannot do it alone. You need support of other countries. <clears throat> United Nations is ready to lead this campaign together with the United States. So let us work together to make this world better for, for all the people who will succeed on this planet Earth. We have only one planet Earth. We don't have two. So we have the responsibility to, to make this planet Earth sustainable way. The sustainable development will be our top priority in the coming years. Again, I thank you very much for your attention. And I count on professors, and particularly young students, to be a global leaders. Thank you very much. Would you be willing to uh, take some questions? Great. General Secretary is willing to take some questions, and uh, why don't we start right there? <clears throat> Maybe uh, also identify your name.
I, uh, uh, I had the chance to partake in several of the Unicorn initiatives and I actually wrote a book about it. Right here, I have a copy of it here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a copy of it here. And um, I'd like to give this to you as a souvenir for your visit to Yale. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to give it to you after the lecture, if possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, perhaps you can peruse it on your way back to New York. <laughs> um, and my, my question is, um, how can an institution such as Yale um, better partner the UN in the coming decade or so? And how can us students get more involved in, in various UN projects? Thank you. Thank you very much. The question uh, sounds uh, some uh, Korean uh, focused way, but this is not. Uh, this is a very good uh, global question uh, concerning how education and educational institutions can contribute and work together with the United Nations. When you say educational training, uh, this is now called what we have termed academic impact. Uh, in fact, you know. Before coming here, I have discussed at length with uh, President Levin. President Levin has been actively participating in what uh, we have established a global colloquium of university presidents. The uh, United Nations has organized uh, a colloquium uh, with um, uh, university presidents like uh, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, New York uh, University, etc. Uh, several universities present have been actively participating in this. Uh, uh, 2010, January, I was here to participate in this uh, global colloquium of university presidents. There came about 40 uh, presidents from around the world uh, where we discussed all uh, sorts of uh, global uh, issues, how United Nations can work with academic uh, institutions. This academic impact, uh, which was initiated by the United Nations, is the initiative where more than 800 international universities participate from 110 countries. Korea is one of them. The present uh, Kim Jong-il of Handong University is now president of academic impact in Korea, in Korea branch. I met him last, uh, <coughs> last month in uh, October when I was in Seoul, and we discussed uh, how uh, we can uh, strengthen this academic impact. I discussed uh, this matter, when I raised uh, this issue to President Levin uh, just uh, uh, about an hour ago, whether Yale University could participate uh, <coughs> in academic impact. It is only natural <coughs> that uh, such a distinguished university like uh, Yale uh, could contribute uh, <coughs> their, their commitment and their leadership role, working together with other uh, universities coming from different, different uh, parts of the world. We have about 10 guidelines how to promote the democracy, how to promote uh, human rights, how to uh, ensure that the women are given full and equal opportunities and how to address uh, poverty and hunger and disease. There are many ways, many ways academic institutions can contribute. It's not only teaching some knowledge. Knowledge you will learn, and maybe it may be forgotten when you graduate, when you engage in some other jobs. But what is important is that in this academic uh, <coughs> institutions, professors teach how the students, the leaders of the future, can become a community leaders and global leaders, and how they can contribute their knowledge and experience to the common goods. Uh, this is the main uh, purpose of academic impact. I hope that uh, next President Salovey will uh, uh, consider Joining this academic impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who is next? <laughs> yes. <coughs> we'll work our way back. <coughs> Why don't you use the microphone? Okay. okay. Yeah, um, I'm glad to hear that you mentioned the Sahel region and the food security issues there. And I wanted to ask you 
how will the UN strategy be different from the one taken in Horn of Africa where there have been continuous food security issues, famine that happened in 91 in Somalia again recently and in Ethiopia as well. So what is the approach to actually have a sustainable solution for these food security issues so that there aren't these constant famines that are causing undue um, human suffering? <coughs> The uh, challenges, <coughs> challenges in Africa is one of the uh, top priorities uh, of the United Nations. When I uh, took over my job as a Secretary General in 2007, my first statement was that uh, we have to address all these uh, human sufferings in Africa. <coughs> Without addressing this one, we will never be able to claim that we are living in a world of a harmonious development where human dignity is respected and promoted. We, we can see all sorts of um, <coughs> challenges, development challenges, security challenges, and human rights challenges. In fact, those are three peace and security, development, human rights, are three pillars of the United Nations Charter. So we are very committed. We have to make sure that the all African countries on board on Millennium Development Goals, all people in Africa should be able to eat without the hunger and should be able to get proper sanitation and healthy cares and should have um, a proper education, at least the primary education. So our goal at this time is to provide all the young students minimum primary education. When I said that 61 million people, students, are not able to go to school, that means a primary school. There has been significant progress uh, in terms of uh, providing education, in terms of cutting <coughs> I have the number of people who are hungry. We made a lot of uh, progress. I appreciate the uh, uh, former president, uh, uh, World Bank, uh, who is now here. Yes. Uh, he, I, I understand that you have just uh, started the teaching in here. Uh, yes, I, I really appreciate uh, his uh, contribution uh, to uh, Millennium Development Goals, and I really thank you very much. This is what the United Nations is doing uh, together uh, with the uh, World Bank, IMF, and the uh, African Union, and the European Union. And please know that the uh, uh, United Nations is a firmly committed uh, to address this uh, human suffering in Africa. Thank you. Question? Why don't we come over here on the end? Yes? Yes? So this might, might be a bit of a break from the policy questions, but um, here in America, we get the New York Times and Yale and the dining halls and we read it. And it seems like the New York Times usually focuses on two kinds of countries, one being the countries that are, are Western and what, the other being the countries that are in some kind of serious trouble. So we read a lot about Syria, we read about, a lot about Mali right now. But as the Secretary General of the United Nations, clearly it's your job to look out for all the countries, not just the ones that are in the news. And so I'm curious, what is your favorite country that you think most of us don't know very much about? <laughs> when it comes to the job of uh, Secretary General, even though I come from uh, Korea, I do not uh, talk much about Korea. But if you ask me to just single out which is the most favorite, favorite country, I should say Korea, my home country. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as a Secretary General, I have to deal with all 193 member states of the United Nations. And there are some countries who are not even the members of the United Nations. So I have to um, address all the issues with the utmost sense of impartiality and objectivity. Not much about this uh, neutrality. <coughs> uh, 
often people believe that the United Nations is a neutral organization. But United Nations, I don't think, is a neutral organization. Sometimes I cannot be neutral. I can be impartial. But I have to criticize when there is a gross violation of human rights, and when there is a serious problem, you know, accountability, and perpetrating all these uh, crimes, then I have to criticize. Then the other side of the being criticized may criticize me that I'm not the neutral. But I am United Nations, and I am very impartial. And regardless where you are coming from, whether you are coming from the West or East, but there is no difference. We are all human beings. We are all enjoying fundamental freedoms and fundamental human rights. The most important thing is that all human beings were born equal with the human rights. That we will try to all what we can. We must to, to uphold the human rights. On the basis of this human right, we have to provide the development. We have to secure security so that everybody can live in peace and harmony in a prosperous world. This is what the United Nations is doing. Maybe we'll move to this side and take the last question. How about all the way in the back there? Yep. No, that's you. Right there. Yep. 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 Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Angelo. I'm from the Yale School of Poetry and Dante Study. So my question is, as the Secretary General of the United Nations, do you see a future when, oh, sorry. Do you see a future when all nations on this planet is actually, are actually united, and every single one of us will identify ourselves as the global citizen. Thank you. That's our uh, ultimate goal, where all the countries, all the people in the world can live uh, peacefully in a harmonious uh, society. Uh, unfortunately, this world is really uh, <coughs> We have seen so many uh, unreasonable, intolerable uh, situations where people simply do not respect the belief and conscience and thoughts and tra tradition and culture and religion of other people. We have seen such a very, very uh, tragic uh, situation where people were killing each other because of the difference of uh, thoughts and religion. This is a totally unacceptable situation. The United Nations plays a great emphasis on promoting mutual respect, mutual understanding among different people, different culture, different tradition. Uh, we have established, uh, initiated uh, what is known as Alliance of Civilization. And this has gotten uh, broader support uh, from <coughs> international community. But whether they practice on the principle of alliance of civilization, that's another matter. That's why we are very much sad uh, to see so many, uh, so many things uh, which is happening uh, in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, I will continue to uh, uh, promote and raise awareness on this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me thank you all for your excellent <coughs> questions. And uh, why don't we thank the Secretary General one more time. And uh, on behalf of Ian Shapiro, you're all invited up to the second floor for a reception. You're coming to dinner? Yeah, they've invited me.